Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I am Pat Ryan Krauss, Professor Emerita of Professor Emerita of Nursing in the Pediatric Specialty at YSN. And I'm currently the moderator of this alumni panel entitled, as you see, How My Global Health Journey Influenced My Career. This program is hosted by the Office of Global Affairs and Planetary Health, and is very well and very wonderfully supported by the Blank Fund. We are grateful to grateful for both of those organizations helping us with this. From 27, from 2007 to 2019, I was involved in the development of global activities at YSN as the interim director of the Center for International Nursing and Scholarship and Education. During that time, a global health concentration was created. Projects were offered to students in South Africa, Hong Kong, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, and Israel. Our students joined interprofessional courses taken at the School of, Nurse, at the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health. Over the subsequent years, YSN has wonderfully expanded its role in global health throughout the university, it's, they're aware of that. And currently, the YSN sponsors a number of new activities and opportunities for clinical experiences and for research experiences for those who are interested in issues related to global populations that need to be researched. In addition to learning how to serve patients abroad, it's also essential for nursing and midwifery students to learn how to serve, provide service and care to, ind to individuals and families who are refugees in the United, or immigrants in the United States. Learning about the global social determinants of health, ethics, um, ethics, customs, and practices are critical for all nurse practitioners and with free students. There are thousands of migrants, immigrants, and refugees currently living in the United States who need to have, have as wonderful care as we're able to give them, just as the care you're giving the global health populations abroad. So the Global Health Track provides now many opportunities in many settings, both abroad and domestically. Domestic opportunities are around global resettlement, uh, local resettlement agencies such as Siri and Iris, non-government organizations such as Elena's Light, and at Yale locations such as Haven Free Clinic and the Pediatric and Adult Refugee Clinics at Yale and Haven Hospital. So we're privileged to have with us on this panel four YSN students who have participated in a wide variety of global health activities before, during, and after their years at YSN. We will hear how their experiences as students have impacted and continue to influence their current work. I am delighted to briefly introduce them to you and then we will hear from them directly. I'm also delighted to see them again after many, many years of, of some contact, but not seeing you very much at all. So thank you very much for being here. So Nicole Trump-Castile is a 2020, uh, 2012 graduate from YSN in the pediatric nurse practitioner specialty. And she was the first, she, she has a remarkable, um, um, remarkable thing to tell us is she was the first nursing student to be awarded a Gruber Fellowship from the Yale Law School. This is quite an accomplishment. And the fellowship allowed Nicole to spend a year in Dominican Republic working directly with families who lived in small community bates and worked in the sugarcane area. Nicole now has returned after her year in 2012 and 2013. She currently re has returned to her, her place of, of, of family and everything. And she currently lives and works in Minneapolis. She's done much work with immigrants and has also acquired an MPH during this time. So she could further understand not only personal health issues, but also community health concerns. She will offer her insights into providing care in international settings and in the US. Simone Nicoletti is a 2016 graduate also of the PNP program. She participated in the YSN project in rural Nicaragua in 2015 
and was subsequently awarded a Downs Fellowship to return to Nicaragua and to continue her work with adolescents. And her focus was on empowerment-focused sexual health education. Her current work continues to involve adolescents with an additional focus on trauma-informed care. Simone will share with us her ongoing commitment and ongoing work to help adolescents develop the knowledge and capacity to make informed choices about their futures. And Patrick Bringardner, also a 2016 YSN graduate from the Family Nurse Practitioner Program, has had a range of global experiences from the Peace Corps to the YSN program in Nicaragua and to Botswana, where from which Patrick earned a a um, Downs Fellowship, which sponsored him for three months while he investigated issues of tuberculosis in Botswana. Patrick is involved in a busy primary care practice on the coast of Oregon, and he will share with us the challenges he faces now and how his global health work has impacted his current work. Camilo Soto Espinoza is our latest graduate, 2021. She graduated from the in midwifery and women's health, and she has a very, very wide range of global health experiences, beginning in Chile, where Camilla was born and raised and where she became a certified midwife. During her time at YSN, she participated in a variety of global activities and became a global health leadership fellow through the Yale Institute of Global Health. As a component of this fellowship, she worked with UNICEF and a number of other global organizations. Mila will share her current work with us and how she integrates her numerous global health experiences into her current work, providing reproductive care to patients with high risk pregnancies. As you can see, each alum has had important and very different and wonderful activities that they've done during their time as students. Before we get into our specific questions for the panel, I would like them to each briefly describe your global health experience. So we can start that with Camilla. Hi, everyone. Um, I was, like you said, I was born and raised in Chile. I am a midwife there, and I midwife for takes five years in Chile of university. I worked for two and a half years and then came here specifically because of um, the global health opportunities that Yale had as a program. And through there, I so I always knew that I wanted to do global health. Through there, I started working with the uh, Office of Global and Planetary Health with um, Pat and with Dr. Um, Lauren Nelson. And then I was the first generation for the Leadership in Global Health Fellowship. And through that, I had the opportunity to work with um, the CDC, with UNICEF, the United Nations. Uh, we did a few projects and presented uh, in countries like Thailand related to um, reproductive health on adolescents during the pandemic. And I was also able to work in multiple research projects um, related to maternal mortality in Latin America. And I graduated with the global health concentration, and um, this was instrumental in the job that I currently have. I work at UCSF as faculty in maternal fetal medicine, and I continue to do research with uh, my global health mentor, Dr. Uh, Rubanski, on maternal fetal medicine and maternal mortality on patients that have had prior C sections. Thank you. That's great. You've done many, many different things. That's great. And how about um, Patrick? Hi, so, Patrick. Uh, <laughs> <Hey you. laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to, to see everyone and kind of connect with this great group of people after all these years. Um, yeah. So, um, so my my first experience um, was in the in the Peace Corps. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Peru. And initially I, I was thinking of maybe kind of doing more kind of ecology, bi biology kind of work, but um, having a chance to interact with healthcare providers um, in, in Peru really, really kind of made me 
uh, I realized that this this was something that I wanted to do too. So went back to school um, to become a nurse, and then and then on on to Yale. Um, and I had a little bit of a chance to to be in uh, Chile as well. I was in Santiago um, as part of a, uh, a study abroad program for um, for about two months, um, and and then at Yale, had, had, like like uh, uh, Patricia already said, I uh, had a chance to go to Botswana, um, where I had an opportunity to kind of learn more about how people felt about. Um, Treat, being treated for tuberculosis, the way in that it was being delivered, the way that the care was being delivered at the time. Um, so rather than having people come to the clinic, um, care was being delivered to the patients. And so no one really knew um, how the patients felt about that. So that was part of my work. Um, then like Patricia said, now I'm um, working in primary care in, in Oregon. And yeah, thank you. Thanks, Patrick. How about Simone? Hi everyone. Um, my, the primary focus of my global health work and experience has been in Nicaragua. Actually, the very first time I went to Nicaragua was with Patrick and um, Pat Ryan Cross. And it really centers on, as Pat mentioned, um, empowerment focused sex ed. So really providing youth with the resources and knowledge to make informed choices about their future. Um, and this is work that I've continued since I, you know, since my global health thesis at YSN to, to today, um, continuing the work in Trujillo and Nicaragua, which is just outside of Leon. Um, and I received a Downs fellowship to be able to do that. So that was part of YSN and Downs really, um, we're, I was fortunate we were able to partner in supporting that work while I was at YSN. And now my work really centers more on um, sort of like the offshoot of that, including how trauma impacts youth and how it in, um, impacts their decision making about their future. Thank you. And Nicole? Hi, um, good evening from Minneapolis. I'm Nicole Castillo. <clears throat> I um, got one of the, I guess it was the first, one of the first nurses um, to get a Gruber Fellowship for Global Justice and Women's Rights. Um, and I went to the Dominican Republic for a year. It was a one year funded opportunity um, and worked in kind of training some of the healthcare staff there, but also doing kind of direct care to the local um, immigrant population, which is mostly mostly Haitian um, who lives in the Dominican Republic and cuts sugar cane. Um, that's kind of the biggest global health experience and the one related to YSN. I also went to Uganda in undergrad for, for a like month. Um, and we go back, my husband is actually from the Dominican Republic. So we go back often and it still is a place that I, that I do global health. <laughs> and now I work at um, Hennepin Healthcare, which is a safety net hospital in Minneapolis and I do primary care. Um, and I would say 50% of all of our patients need an interpreter or something around there. Yeah. Probably more um, when I am working because I speak Spanish, it's more like 90%, I don't know, <laughs> something like that. Wow. Um, and thanks for having me. Okay, thank you, Nicole. So thank you, thanks to all of you for sharing your experiences with us. Um, I, as you might know, some of the people who registered for this event submitted questions, and I had also prepared some questions. So I have kind of, um, kind of uh, incorporated questions together, both the ones that I put out and the ones that the um, audience had. So we're going to start with questions, okay? And there's like two. There are, I have to speak more fully. There are two, um, two sections of questions. One is the um, experiences that you might have had when you were working abroad. And the second set of questions is um, what you currently do and how your work and your experience abroad has might have impacted your current work, okay? So I'm going to ask not everyone to respond to every question, but um, why don't we start with um, Simone and Nicole 
kind of thinking about this question. And then if, if, you, if, if Patrick and, and um, Camilla have comments they would like to make, that's absolutely terrific, okay? So this was a question submitted by a young man who is a student now in the um, PhD program here. And his question was, what were the most inspiring or challenging aspects you experienced while engaged in global health activities? So have some, you have a moment or so to think about that for sure. In terms of the most inspiring aspects of global health work, I would say, Bar none, it was the youth that I worked with um, who were incredibly resilient at all odds and are truly like the, they are the entire infrastructure of what is now called La Charla, the nonprofit that really supports these activities. And, and just seeing how amazingly curious these youth are. And, um, and then I would say like the driver of that was actually Pat, not to put you on the spot, but a conversation I had with Pat when I was starting my global health work that was really centered on making sure that when you're thinking about solutions in global health work, that you're not doing like volunteerism, that you're not just showing up, providing a service and leaving, um, but that you're really responsive to what the community is actually asking for and then centering the community in the solution. Um, so I would say like, you know, the combination of that that perspective and then the youth really um, being the solution to all of the needs assessments that were um, developed in the work is was the most inspiring piece of this to me. Um, I would say the most challenging piece is that so much of global health work is driven by research dollars and the ability um, to create an initiative that is rooted in research when so much I think of the meaningful global health work is actually like rooted in initiatives that are community centered and aren't necessarily reflective of large scale research projects. Um, that was probably the most like challenging part of that process for me. Would you like to say a few words about La Charla? Yes, yeah, so um, La Charla is the, uh, the brainchild of <laughs> Pat and myself and Esperanza, who is the nurse that works in Chorilo, Nicaragua, um, and is really the, the organization that has been born from the work that was done back in 2015, 2016, when um, I first went down to Nicaragua. And so the, the idea is um, it is a, a effectively a sex ed program that's peer led. So youth are teaching their peers about sexual and reproductive health, about um, leadership skills, about drug abuse prevention, about opportunities um, in their community. And then in exchange for leading the program for two years, they are matched with a US donor and are given um, full university scholarship for the duration of their university experience. So in Nicaragua, that's five years. And then these youth actually come, tend to come back and help work and, and support the program. So it's a really sustainable community-driven solution um, that was born in my Downs YSM uh, fellowship back in 2015. Um, and it's still, still growing strong. We have 80 students who have graduated from the program. We have another 80 who are currently receiving the um, weekly Charla, the weekly initiatives. Um, and yeah, it's really exciting. Um, Thanks, Simone. That's great. That's great news. And Nicole, let's hear about your work. Yeah, I feel like that was hard to follow. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think, you know, the most challenging is, I'll start with that, um, <clears throat> is just being completely um, the outsider. I feel like just like our, a lot of our refugee Im immigrant families, when they come come here is, you know, you don't look like everybody else. You don't eat like everybody else. You don't speak the language like everybody else. Um, and you don't understand healthcare and how the healthcare system works. Um, and so that took a lot of getting used to and a lot of kind of struggle to make it to the point where I was helpful. You know, there was a lot of time where I wasn't super helpful um, mm -hmm. because of that. Um, and I think the most inspiring was, was figuring out how to kind of use some of the community health workers and the system to get kids care that they 
that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten. So, you know, using people who were already going out to the batets for something else to bring medicine or bring a kid back into the hospital and, and just kind of seeing the community um, pull together with the resources that we had, which was sometimes imperfect, um, but, but got kids care that uh, if they didn't get, could have, could have been a bad outcome most likely would have been a bad outcome. Thank you. That's a, that's a great uh, awareness of the, how people feel as they're, as they come to a new place that they're different and they don't look alike and they don't eat the same kinds of foods or have the same kind of customs. So I think that's a really important awareness to have. And that's, that's great that you were aware of that and, um, and went through that yourself. So thank you. So Patrick? The question I'm going to ask Patrick is, what was the greatest, this is a question from um, uh, Carmen Portillo, who is the deputy dean at the School of Nursing now. And what was the greatest lesson learned from your experience? That's a big question. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if I could just pick one, but um, probably at, at least as far as you know, sitting here now, like being a, a healthcare provider is, is knowing kind of having had the, the chance to see that there's, there's more than one way to deliver healthcare and that it does take kind of being dynamic and flexible to see which way is going to work the best, not necessarily for, um, maybe insurance purposes, things like that, but at least as far as best outcomes for the, for the patient and their, and their family. Um, so kind of having a chance to kind of see healthcare at work in, in settings where there are, where resources are limited, roads are bad, cars are falling apart, <laughs> buses are not showing up. Sometimes things don't go as planned, but people still need care. And so there, there are lots of ways to, to make it happen. And so rather than, um, I guess, I don't know, I can't think of a, maybe a printer jam or, <laughs> or like <laughs> mouse, is, I don't know. but if, if there are so many things that could, could possibly kind of make us feel that, um, you know, have a, are frustrating, hold us back. Um, but just kind of, I, I know that, um, in you know, other parts of the world, there are incredible obstacles that providers have to overcome, patients have to overcome, families have to overcome. Um, and so it, it kind of gave me the resilience to kind of be brave and be patient um, in spite of any kind of obstacle that might, might come along. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Thank mm -hmm. you. And Camila. Oh. The same question. Um, what was the greatest lesson that you learned from your experiences abroad or from your experiences anywhere? I um, I feel like I got the unique experience of being in both sides of global health. I was a midwife in a place that is does not put most of their finances in um, and resources on research. I relied entirely on the research of other countries and the um, efforts of other countries to provide better care to my patients. And uh, one, I had very a very strong interest to go into global health because I wanted to serve those people in areas that where resources were limited and could not be allocated to things like you know investigating this new medication. My entire country's healthcare system depends on the medication with the most research so that money is invested correctly and, you know, making sure that everyone has access to this one medication rather than providing many options like in the U.S. And when I became a part of, you know, global health and I started going into this route, as I had that um that part of me that knew that I was working towards becoming this person that was going to serve someone like me three or four years ago. Um, and the other thing is that I don't think that there's a lot of people of color and um, 
in global health. Uh, global health is um, so far has been mainly led by countries that have enough resources, and those are usually countries like the US, like England. And being a part of that group and connecting um, with people of color and having that connection, that cultural connection, and being able to use my you know, resources and my knowledge of multiple healthcare systems has made me a better provider overall for everyone. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And, that, and that's, um, and that's great. And you all have language, don't you? You all have, you, I know that you speak Spanish and Simone speaks Spanish and Nicole speaks Spanish. And what if, Patrick, you speak Spanish as, as well. Are there, are there any other languages that you've acquired? No? Well, Spanish is very useful. I have never mastered it as much many times as I've gone to Nicaragua. Okay, now the, this this question is is has been submitted by one of the students, a midwifery student, um, and I think it's a very difficult question to respond to. So um, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so the question is, how have you ensured that your global health work is sustainable and produces independence in the community? So I think it's a difficult question. So any, I'm not going to specify who should respond to it. Anybody can respond. I would hope some of you can respond to that question. It doesn't have a, you know, obviously it doesn't have a, a final answer because it's every situation is different. But if you have any any thoughts about how you have made or how you can make your work sustainable, that would be great to share with us. Okay, great. Um, that that's a wonderful question. I that is. Actually, the um, because of the experiences that I had, I would bring that question forward in every project that I would engage in. Um, whether this program was sustainable or would move with you, would it be something that I was bringing in and then taking away, or is it something that will, in some way, leave something to the community? So all the projects I've been a part of are intended to train people or are created for people that work in that healthcare system, mm -hmm. that are um, intrinsically a part of uh, the social cultural aspects of this community. And you know that in a way limits the amount of time that you can spend interacting with the community you know, themselves, but it also provides reassurance that you're creating something that will continue without you the minute that you're gone, yeah. which, um, has been my goal in every single project I involve myself in. And that was a commitment that I did a long time ago, precisely because I didn't want to be in groups that would take resources and take them away and create kind of very band-aids to, you know, large mm -hmm. hemorrhages in these places that did not have, um, that needed sustainability and needed continuity of care and needed continuity of support. Yeah. That's a wonderful response, Camila. I mean, I think that's what I tried really hard to do in Nicaragua is to train, you know, to help train the people around what their needs were, what they identified as their needs, especially the community health workers who can have such a great impact on, on the whole situation. So thank you. That was great. Any other responses to that? How is our work sustainable? I mean, I think Camila's answer is perfect. Um, I would say, like, I still see the impact, Pat, of the work that you did with the Brigadistas in Nicaragua, because when you, tr when you, like, really keep your blueprint as small as possible when you enter these communities and really make sure that you're either there for training purposes or a linkage or um, connecting to actually long-term sustainable solutions that will exist once you leave, then then those solutions are able to like flourish and, and grow, right? So the work that Pat did with the Brigadistas in Trujillo meant that when COVID hit, these Brigadistas, these community health workers were actually really well equipped to be able to support their community and provide a like an active response, an active community-centered response to ensure that they kept their COVID levels down to essentially almost zero for a large portion of COVID while the rest of Nicaragua was getting decimated by COVID. And that is because they had their own internal resources to be able to support it. 
that were born from a much more community focused initiative. Yeah, that's right. Patrick or Nicole, any comments? Um, I, I think at least I'm, I can't say I'm, I haven't um, been back to Botswana. I have, I have not been back to Peru other than to hike Machu Picchu, <laughs> which <laughs> wasn't really global work. Um, but I'm always um, kind of looking forward to the next opportunity. And, and I, I think sustainability has to be part of, of any kind of intervention. And at least I've been fortunate, all of the mentors that I've had, including Pat, um, have really focused on that. So I, I never necessarily felt that what I was doing was not going to last in a meaningful way. Um, but I, I think that is a very important part of any kind of project that we do really anywhere, whether it's um, in the United States or, or, or abroad. Thanks, Patrick. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say really quickly, Camila, um, I. I really appreciated your point. And I think when I was abroad in the Dominican Republic, I would say I was very much learning that lesson and probably part of the problem for some of it, even though it was focused on doing education for community health workers. Um, I do think it has taught me, at least I hope it think, I think it's taught me how to center the people that are doing the work where I am right now, who are people of color who understand the community without having to be, you know, without having it to be about me, <laughs> which is really easy to do. It's easy to be like, you know, I had that idea and I, but kind of being the support person and like, I think that's a great idea and you should do it and you should be, in, you know, I'll do, kind of like, give me the work and I'll do it, but like you're in charge. Um, and you know, I have family now in the Dominican Republic. So in that way, it's sustainable because I'm still going back there. But but I don't I think that's a that's a hard question to answer. Um, and and I didn't do it perfectly by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Those are great responses. It's, it's, I think that's the really an important part of what we do in global health is to make sure that we can continue and we're not just dropping in and then dropping out again. So thank you for those good responses. <laughs> now, the final question in this section is, have you experienced any ethical issues while working in global settings that, that, that really challenge you? I guess I can take this one again. Um, I, you know, it kind of goes back to what I was just saying, which is, this is not my country. This is, you know, I'm not in charge of everybody or the director of how we're going to do this. Um, and one of the ways that shows up is, is newborn care. So like a kind of NICU, um, early babies. And, um, you know, there was a couple times where I was at the hospital in the emergency room or like out in the bate, and there would be a baby born at, you know, here of age that typically is viable, like a 34, 33 weeker. Um, and the attending pediatrician showing up and being like, you know, telling the mom, like, you should say goodbye to your baby. They're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and being like, you know, what do you do? Right. Like, it's not my hospital. I'm not, I don't, I'm not on staff. <laughs> I'm not going to try to tell this woman how to treat her patients. Um, mm -hmm. So that, and I, and what did I do? I, I did nothing. I let her, because it was her hospital run the show. It's her, she gets to do what, you know, how the, how the yeah. hospital works, but things like that, I think are the times where, yeah, like ethical things come up. You just kind of freeze in the moment and, and aren't quite sure if they want help or just like in that moment, the doctor was like, please just hold her hand and rub her, you know, like give her some emotional support, which is what I did. Um, but yeah, those are tricky when you're like, this baby should make it like oh, try kid group yeah. care, you know, um, which is one of the things that, that we did leave them with as, as there was some more pediatrician residents who came from Cohen children's in New York, they did work a lot with kangaroo care. So yeah. it was something that I noticed and kind of talked to them about, and then they were able to help with that. But yeah, that's just something I can think about off the top of my head. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks, Nicole. That's a really good example. I think. Have you experienced that too, Camilla? Um, most, I feel that global health and at least from the Yale perspective, um, 
has been Yale overall has been very responsible in the way that they have structured the global health projects that I have seen. Um, I could tell that there was a history there. Global health by itself is a pretty new field. Um, and um, like Nicole's experience um, at that time when the field was pretty new makes so much sense to me. And, you know, I'm glad to see that things have overall change and that now that is a part of, you know, the priorities that you have when you're creating a project. Most of the things where um, when, you know, black and brown bodies are used to train white people are, have been the things I've seen the most um, when it comes to ethical issues. Um, a lot of, we're currently doing a, a protocol for breach deliveries, which is a skill that the US lost a long time ago in obstetrics. Um, and replace them with C-sections and a lot of the experiences, negative experiences come from people that train in areas that are, you know, areas that don't have established healthcare systems or have a lot of rural areas. So healthcare access is limited. When And then when you talk to people that came and train in areas like Finland and France where breach deliveries happen pretty regularly, the experience is completely different. Um, their views of um, breach deliveries are completely different. And so um, half of these people went directly to uh, a group of countries to be able to train in this. Um, and they were using black and brown, uh, brown bodies to be able to do that. While the other group went into a hospital and was invited to a fellowship and was welcomed into a system to train. And they had vastly different experiences throughout this. Mm. Uh, but I feel that now, and again, the more you create this awareness, the more you um, invite and welcome and create spaces for people of color to join programs, you start reducing that risk and you start restructuring these programs. For ex and for example, now we're, you know, everyone that will go and support and train folks in other countries where healthcare systems have more difficulties, have to go through training first in areas like France and, and Finland to be able to gain that skill um, because you're there to contribute, not to experiment, um, which is, you know, it's a part of the history of global health, unfortunately, at least from, you know, countries like the US and England but that you know we now have the opportunity to start changing and i do feel yale has been pretty good at establishing programs and connecting you with programs that only have sustainability and only have that aspect of you know inclusivity and cultural awareness um and limit or completely remove programs that could risk you into going into ethical situations mm. like on that for example nicole experience yeah thank you that was great and that's that's all very important. Um, anyone else for comments on that? Okay, so now we're going to move to um, hopefully, so uh, move to a section where you will share how your experience in previous global settings has impacted your current work. I think Nicole, you've told us a little bit about that. Um, anybody else ready for that? How have your global health studies and experiences affect, and I'm going to make it a little bit more specific. How have your global health studies and experiences affected your knowledge of health disparities? And has this knowledge impacted your current practice? Health disparities. I think, um... It, it's been a real lesson in like assume nothing, right? You really come in with um, the willingness to keep your ears open and um, hear from whether it's like the family in your exam room or the community that you're going into, um, what it is that they actually need, right? And what they think realistic solutions look like. I think so often, especially as medical providers, you know, for in primary care settings or any kind of um, setting where we're just moving really quickly, we have already this like, it's the like completing the chart before you even walk in the room, right? And how incredibly unpatient centered that, that process is. Um, and then you end up, you know, in that 
in that way, you end up kind of already deciding that you know the solution to this family's problem before they've even opened their mouth, right? And it's, I think working in global health was a real lesson in the futility of paternalistic medicine. Because when you come into a room and you recognize like, oh, you're going to go in there and you're going to talk to them about like, you know, changing the diaper every time it's wet. And yet like they don't have access to diapers or, um, you know, making sure that the crib is like up to standard, but they are using like a cardboard box for a crib. The, it's, there's such a, a gap sometimes between what we think, like what we learn about in a textbook and what is actually real life for many of our families and the ability to actually just like take a beat and go into a, an exam room and just listen and not try to be preparing your answer. Um, I think global health taught me more than that more than anything. Mm. That's good. That's good. Because disparities are certainly out there and it's really important to to just listen and just talk to people and find out what their needs are and how you can help them. I mean, many babies are put in boxes to, you know, for beds and things and um, that's, that's okay. Anybody else that have any? So, about- Simone, you're, you're, you're brilliant. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, so glad you, so glad to see you and hear from you. Um, so, and I, I think, very similar, I think, I, from what I've seen, unless, at least in um, when I was a, a, working abroad on, on some of my projects, unless the, the the whole context is very important, like you were saying with the crib, um, it being a box instead of a crib, th- knowing where the patient lives, who the family is, what they do for work, all of those things are important. And, and yeah, and I think, unfortunately, Oftentimes, the, the medicine that we see um, that's practiced here, d- we don't get any of that information. But when we have that information, there's there's so much that we can do with it. We can know we can involve family members. We can involve friends. If if we know what what they do for work, we can help them adjust and adapt and and get back to work as soon as possible. Or if it's the job that's causing their health problems, then we can work on addressing that as well. Um, but if, if, it, if care is being provided in a, in a vacuum, then it's just, it's just not, not going to go anywhere. Um, and so having, seeing um, how important healthcare workers are in other countries and how supportive family members can be um, and, or neighbors um, was, um, really kind of eye-opening to see that, that that's kind of what oftentimes we're, we're not emphasizing here. Some, and also knowing a little bit about their hobbies as well mm-hmm. and likening their getting better to being able to do more of the things that they love and at least asking what they enjoy doing mm-hmm. um, and kind of help, helping that be, or having that be part of the, the, the picture of, of health um, has been a, a big has been a big influence on my practice I would say yeah and that's wonderful Patrick but it's because it's so important to know all those details about families I mean it just makes it just much more you know much more helpable than you, when you you can help much more when you know things but it's so frustrating to me now when, how healthcare has changed in the U.S. as far as um we have 20 minutes now for, uh, for appointments. And that's regardless of whether you need an interpreter. It's 20 minutes at the primary, well, it's not the primary care center anymore, but it's uh, Fairhaven. And that's, that's all that we have. That's all that students have, which is a really difficult place to learn because all of that information that you talked about, Patrick, is so important to, to giving good overall care to the family. So thank you for that. Any other thoughts about that? Health disparities. Okay, the next question then is, how have your experiences enhanced your awareness of the need to provide culturally and linguistically appropriate services? And how have you been able to do this? 
if and how you've been able to do this. Culturally and linguistically appropriate services. Something that I was thinking about um, as you all were talking about the last question is, um, I do nursery, so I do newborn rounding and discharging, and we're, you know, the only large um, safety net hospital here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, and we also happen to be the hospital where George Floyd was brought to and pronounced um, dead. Um, and so there's been a lot going on over here, <laughs> um, as specifically in this hospital where I'm sitting right now. Um, and one of the things I noticed pretty early on um, working here is that we started to have these babies that I discharge where I'm getting messages from the ER, like um, this baby came in with SIDS um, and was pronounced, you know, is either in our PICU with SIDS and has now neurological complications from like almost dying, but not, you know, not quite like suffocation, but not quite death or they were like actually dying. And because we have a number, like a pretty high number of babies who are born here, you know, statistically you're gonna run into it. But I, so I started thinking about it more and more. And I was like, all of these babies are born to the same kind of person, right? They're all born kind of in the same zip code to the same kind of mom who doesn't have stable house or whatever. There, there was like a pattern that started to develop. Um, and so that's why I actually went and got my master's in public health, because I was like, I feel equipped to deal with that's an ear infection. And, um, you know, you should rear face your car seat, <laughs> but I don't feel equipped. And I feel frustrated by like all these messages I'm getting through Epic of like, what is happening? You know, there was this, I think it was just one really bad winter. Um, but it's the same pattern. And if you look at the, if you look at Minnesota, our infant mortality rate looks pretty good nationwide, but if you sparse it out, like between different, um, racial and ethnic groups, it looks horrific. Um, and so that's that I worked with the Minnesota department of health, um, to look at all of their birth and death records, um, with WIC information and look at housing instability in the introduction of formula through WIC, um, and a couple of other factors of like, you know, a lot of times you'll hear in the media, it's like um, almost like blaming people for having bad outcomes that are that are poor or because they're black or brown. Um, and it was really noticeable that people with unstable housing um, and people who weren't given the opportunity to breastfeed or couldn't um, were having worse outcomes, even when you when you controlled for all the other variables. So I think my my prior experience has um in global health has made me focus on how does this system work and why is this happening um and using that even though i'm from the u.s and i work in a u.s hospital like using that kind of outside like watching and seeing what's happening and then and then um figuring out what's important to me to kind of work on wow that's great nicole it's important I would just add, I think, you know, when Latrella started and I was in Trilo, I was initially providing, like doing the sex ed for the kids. And I realized like, obviously very early on, they were to get so much less out of it. If this like woman who came from the U.S. who's not from their community is trying to talk to them about like safe sex and preventing STIs versus like, if I actually just taught them like gave them the knowledge and then let them teach each other and stay back and stay out of the way. Um, and it was really a lesson in the role of representation and how much better outcomes are when people feel represented by their care providers. And seeing that, you know, fast forward, you know, eight years working in the Bayview in San Francisco, providing primary care, seeing that just the difference in care that is received when people come in with a lot of trauma, with a lot of average childhood experiences, and they're, the relationship that's able to be fostered when they feel that their clinician is representative of their community or can speak the same language or has like an intimate understanding of their unique traumas and obstacles versus like when their care is provided by somebody who, you know, essentially exists in an entirely different world than them. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's all the more reason to really push for better um, diversity in the healthcare system so that people actually have a choice, right? Like 
if you are a black pregnant woman coming into a hospital, you want your care provided to you by somebody who is has an intimate understanding of your unique situation. If you are Spanish speaking, you don't want to necessarily have a translator there, um, you know, changing the way, like potentially changing the message that you're trying to relate to your provider, especially in really vulnerable moments. So I think just it's, it is the role of representation in healthcare. Thank you. Okay, well, we, I just got notified that we have nine minutes left. Okay, so um, there's one question that this is, um, I'd like all, both, all of you to respond to. And it's based on your, the question is, based on your global experiences at YSN, how and why would you encourage current YSN students to pursue global health courses and activities at YSN or the School of Medicine or the School of Public Health? So I, I'll just say, uh, there's so, so many reasons, but um, um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief because I'm sure everybody else has some good ones too but I, I would say that it's over um the the few years that I've been um working as a, a primary care provider what I've seen um is nothing compared to the the three months four months that I had a chance to spend in Botswana um and so the experience is just it's so intense that the, you get to see Everything from um, executive levels of healthcare, from planning and management, as well as what it looks like on the ground, um, how that healthcare is delivered, what it looks like from the patient experience, what it looks like when they get back home. Um, it's 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 really incredible. And to to try to disassemble healthcare in the United States, it's complicated. Trying to see what happens when patients leave the office. It's complicated, um, but there, everything is just, it, for at least being in a rural setting, everything is very intimate. Um, and so it, it's an opportunity to really see what healthcare is, um, what it, and what it should do. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I can follow that. Um, hmm. I have, I want to address like two separate groups. One is um, for my people of color in healthcare, and I this is the way that you maximize the impact that you as a provider have when you enter a system that's primarily white. Um, you learn the ways in which you can, the resources you have, and the tools that you have to connect with other people that have the same goals that you have, and um, this is the way that you again increase the impact of the actions that you're taking while also using resources from the system. I went into academics and I knew I wanted to go into academics because my focus was global health and the resources that I needed to be able to expand on the things that I knew that my population needed desperately um, were not accessible in Chile. They, only, they were only here. And so all the decisions that I have made for my professional, in my professional life have been targeted, um, have an end goal of me being able to lead teams or participate in teams that will eventually provide assistance and provide resources to people in my community. And um, this is an incredible, again, this is an incredibly white centric um, field and these spaces need to be occupied by us as well. And we have every right to do so. Mm. On the end of, you know, um, white folks, particularly white folks that are from the US, I think that being the minority in any space is very healthy for someone that comes from a culture that has such a global reach. Um, because you see the restaurants that you grew up in everywhere you go. Uh, people know so much about your culture everywhere you go. Um, but being but sitting in a space where um, you know you are the minority in that group helps you create perspectives that other people have never had in their lives, and it's it's dangerous to not know the discomfort and fear and um, 
uh, insecurity and unsafety that comes from being in a place where you don't know the language, where you are, at, you know, at the mercy of a team of people that you don't know are, whether they're going to have the best interests at heart for you or not. And to then be the provider on the other side when you're having these patients that are coming to you in those circumstances, I think are, you know, will make you a better provider, will make you more conscious and kind and um, sensible provider and um, make you take those actions more carefully and think about it twice since this has now been an experience you have. Yeah, that, thank you. That's that's wonderful information. Wonderful thoughts. Simone and Nicole, anything? Why would you why would you encourage current YSN students to participate in global activities at YSN? <laughs> I would. I mean, Camila, you did a great job <laughs> of highlighting why it was so important for me. Um, you know, I, it was like being the one who didn't fit the puzzle. Um, and that was good for me. You know, it wasn't something that I was used to. Um, and I think here, um, it has allowed me to have more honest and kind of real conversations about like things like implicit bias or like where my, um, blind spots, cause we even, you know, if we are focusing on improving them, they're still there. Um, rather than doing what is more typical in what I was taught, which is like be defensive and I'm not that I'm whatever. And um, so I think it has allowed me to be a better coworker and also, a, a, you know, to not run from conflict, which is like, you're upset about this and that's okay. I can sit here while you're upset and I'm not going to go grab somebody else or, have a fight with you or tell the nurse to tell you something. Cause I don't want to talk to you anymore. Um, and I think, I think about it a lot with the child protection, child protection system, um, and how I would want to be treated. And, um, yeah, I think, I think global health has allowed me to apply those skills that I learned, um, to patients here. Um, so. Thank you. Simone, anything? No, nope. yes, no. I just, yeah. I, I think everybody said such, um, provides such valuable information. I, I think it's just, it's getting out of your box, right? Like it's, it's learning about the world around you and recognizing that the U.S. is not the paradigm for all of healthcare. Um, and that the, like, things that really drive people's concept of their health and wellness are so much more than what, like, our very small understanding of it is. Um, and so it's just, it's shifting the paradigm from like you being the person with all the answers to learning, like in global health, you're really forced to take a back seat. Like I tell all my kids when I have visits with them, like you are in the driver's seat and you decide if I'm in the like seat next to you, if I'm in the back seat, if I'm like seven cars back, that is up for you to decide. And recognizing like global health teaches you that sometimes like you have to take the steering wheel for five seconds, but then you might get thrown several cars back. And it's, it's constantly the shifting role and you have to be adaptable and you have to recognize like it's just not about you. Um, and I, I'm very grateful for global health for being able and my experiences in global health for being able to teach me that because it can give me so much, some, so much more of a responsive provider. Thank you. Well, I have been notified that we are, unfortunately, our time is about over. Um, and I want to thank many individuals um, who participated in, in this webinar, um, especially to the to the, the panelists who were wonderful in, in contributions to this discussion today and all these important issues that you brought up. Thank you so much for the, all of that. All of you did a wonderful job of, of, of talking and making sure that we all have the right right ideas about doing global health. I'd also like to thank our audience who has taken the time to be with us during this evening and who have shared their thoughts and questions with the panel, which we didn't have time really to do, but we may get some later. Um, thank you. I'm thankful for the Planck Fund for sponsoring this activity and for members of the Global Health, um, the Office of Global Health and um, Planetary Health and all the people in that in that group 
um, Laron Nelson and Sahani and Marianne Marshak and um, uh, Zhao Di and all of the others who have put a lot of, of tireless work into putting this together. And especially um, coming from someone who's not a tech person at all, I'm especially thankful for Joe DiMaggio and Shannon and their staff at the Yale Conference and Events Office who have helped put this together technically. So um, I'm so glad, it's been so good to see you guys on the, up there. And I still remember you, Patrick, um, dancing with Yadira on the on the porch of the, uh, the health post. <laughs> and I remember Simone um, walking hand in hand with your arm around one of the nursing students that had come from the university and in Nicaragua that spent the week with us and walking down the path with, together. And uh, I think about you, Nicole, and kind of how we how we um, figured out a, a good place for you to, to do your, your Gruber Fellowship, which, which worked out really well. And I can remember you, Camilla, when you first came to the US and you were at the nursing school, I remember talking to you a lot about what your, what your plans were and what your needs were, and it was great, it was a great conversation. So thank you all very, very much for, for spending your time with us tonight and sharing those good thoughts and good, good messages for us all. So thank you all very much. And thank you to the audience as well.